Good evening and welcome everyone to the inaugural She Sells National Leadership Conference. What a fantastic initiative to bring everyone together at a time when a lot of people feel far apart. So well done Australian Sailing and She Sales. My name is Sue Cormack, I'm your facilitator tonight and it promises to be a jam-packed program with ideas about women and girls and participation, inclusion and diversity, and importantly, gender equity. So sit back, relax, and absorb. And before I go any further, I would also like to acknowledge all of the traditional owners and custodians of the land of the places where you are tonight, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging leaders, and of course, any community leaders who are online tonight. A little bit of housekeeping, just to let you know that we are recording this program tonight for future viewing. And there will be, for our final two speakers, an opportunity for you to interact with them through the Q&A. And I'll give you the tip when that Q&A function is open. So please, let's launch the night by hearing from Sarah Ogilvie from Australian Sailing. Sarah is the Club Pathways Lead and will give us some insights into her role, but also her background and some of the things or positive changes she's seen in sailing over her time. So thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Sue. And hello everyone, and welcome to the National She Sales Leadership Conference. On behalf of Australian Sailing, uh, the National She Sells Working Group, um, She Sells sponsor, uh, Hamilton Island, and all of the Australian Sailing staff, a huge welcome and thank you for joining us today. Um, as Sue said, my name is Sarah Ogilvy and I am the National Club Pathway Lead for Australian Sailing. And in my role, I'm responsible for implementing pathway programs uh, for member participation and retention in sailing. And this includes coaching program development and resources and training for clubs and for coaches to provide some um, programs for our members. So my, my background is fairly extensive in the sport of um, in this sport. I've had the privilege of um, representing Australia in uh, many world championships, winning three of them and also representing Australia into Olympic Games, where I finished fourth in both of my of those events. Um, and my journey from racing finished in 2008, and I moved into coaching after those Olympic Games. And I would have to say that that move into coaching is, is the reason why I'm here today. Um, at the time, there were only just a handful of women coaching, and it was, it was quite a challenge. There was inequality in, in roles and opportunities and, and too in pay. And, and with that experience, um, it initiated an idea for me to start an all-female coaching regatta. And that first one was back in 2014. Um, and the decision was that every role on the water needed to be held by women. And I'm proud to say that at these events, we had um, up to 25 women in leadership roles in either coaching um, or officials. And at some of those events, we had over 70 females participating. Those regattas that I started were more than coaching though. They were about um, giving events to our smaller clubs. And they were also about creating a safe community and also supporting local community. And they were also about giving girls and women the confidence to go back to their own clubs, to participate as coaches, as officials and as sailors. So it gave them the opportunity to practice those skills at that regatta. Um, back in 2014, the She Sells brand or initiative wasn't around. Um, however, it was events such as mine and other activities that were happening in pockets around the country that did create a movement of change for our sport. And um, from, from those events that I did initiate um, and my sailing experience, I was able to join the Australian Sailing Board uh, from 2017 to 2019. And it was at this time when I was on the Australian Sailing Board 
I was honoured to be part of a decision that we were, Australian Sailing was to adopt the She Sails brand, which was actually initiated 10 years prior um, by Newcastle Cruising Yacht Club. So from, from my um, position held at the board, I moved actually into some paid roles in sailing. Um, I became the head of sailing at a large club in Melbourne. And now um, in this most recent role that I've held with Australian Sailing for the last 10 months. I guess what, what I love um, is that when there's a challenge, there's also an opportunity for positive change to occur. And with the challenges um, and the change I've participated in and observed over my sailing years, tonight's like, or well, nights like tonight um, are just really exciting and, and pleasing to be part of. And it's up to all of us, I think, when we, we see these challenges ahead of us to turn them into opportunities going forward. And I really look forward to seeing what happens over the coming years, you know, with all of us in this community. So just to, to finish off and move on is on behalf of Australian Sailing, I would like to thank Hamilton Island who have been a major partner of She Sails since its inception in 2019. It's Hamilton Island's belief that female participation is crucial to long-term success of our sport. And, and they are really proud to be able to assist us through their role with She Sails. And it's with thanks to the support of Hamilton Island that we are able to grow the She Sails initiative and most importantly, deliver events and activities such as tonight's webinar. So, so with this, I'd like to hand over to an inspirational woman, Sarah Kenny, who I had the opportunity to learn from when Sarah was the Vice President um, of the Australian Sailing Board and now Vice President of World Sailing. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, as you'll soon discover, there's a lot of Sarahs on this call tonight. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, to talk about and celebrate women in sailing. I've been asked to uh, share with you my journey to where I am today. Um, I started um, decades ago as a keen junior sailor, racing dinghies at a very small volunteer club in Sydney. Um, I, I moved on to sailing a full rig laser, racing against mostly men, and thankfully um, it was the, the heyday of windsurfing, which res rescued me from that fate. Um, although very pleasingly, not too long after that, that the radial rig emerged and became a, a much more suitable piece of equipment for, for women in sailing. Um, I only had a, a pretty brief opportunity to compete internationally in those days. We women mostly they were working full time. We studied full time. There was no real uh, support, um, but I did get the chance to compete uh, in windsurfing uh, while I was completing my degree, and then um, graduated and. Uh, decided that I'd better get, get stuck into my career. Um, I, I became a lawyer and was pretty much subsumed by that for about 10 years and did very little and maybe even none, uh, no on the water activities for about 10 years. And it was actually in the lead up to the Sydney Olympics in 2000 when um, Australian Sailing asked for some help with some selection disputes and that reconnected me with the Federation. And that connection then opened up some opportunities to join um, panels and ultimately led to an appointment and then election to the board and uh, the appointment as vice president sometime later and actually completed my maximum term on the board. We, we do have a, a maximum terms in Australian sailing to, to keep rejuvenating, keep the ideas with new people on the board and that finished in 2019. I think fortunately for me when I reconnected with Australian sailing, world sailing was also on a bit of a push to try and diversify their members and um, volunteers on all their committees and they were asking the member nations to please put forward more women to world sailing for committees. So I had the opportunity then to be nominated for and then sit on a number of world sailing committees which I did for two quads, eight years. And then as I became better known within those circles, I had the privilege of chairing the events committee of world sailing last quad and also represented Oceania on Council of World Sailing, which is a decision making body, and then finally decided I would stand uh, for election for, for the Board of World Sailing and was appointed as a, uh, a vice president last year. 
So I'm in a four year term now uh, in that role. Um, I think we have actually started to make some really positive progress at the global level. Uh, I think Australia has been doing a pretty good job uh, for quite a while now. Uh, and certainly that's been my experience with the opportunities and the way in which we've continually had a really strong representation of, of women in on the board and in leadership roles. But of course, like everywhere, we can always do better. I thought I'd just touch on some of the, the things that I've personally been involved with in the global level. Um, and the first of those um, is that this year in Tokyo at the sailing event, for the very first time, we had the same number of female athletes as male athletes in the sailing competition. Um, then in Paris in 24, again, for the very first time, we will have the same number of medals available for the women as the men. And I'm sure many are thinking, well, it's about time. Um, that's no big deal. But, you know, remember, you know, even when I was starting out, when I raced internationally, there were no women's events in the Olympic Games. You know, we only had the first one in, in 1988. So um, I think we've come a long way. We've still got a long way to go, but that's a really good start. Four of the nine directors on the World Sailing Board are women, and we have more women than ever on the World Sailing Committee. So I think, um, you know, we're starting to make progress, uh, still a lot more to do. Um, really looking forward to hearing the inspirational stories of everyone participating tonight. Australian Sailing's She Sails National Leadership Forum uh, is part of World Sailing's Steering the Course uh, Festival. Um, that's a 10-day event that we've held earlier in the year in the Northern Hemisphere and the second one in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I'm sure we're all quite disappointed we can't have as many uh, club on the ground activities as we would have liked due to the lockdown, but um, with luck, we can continue some of those activities as soon as we are all free. Um, World Sailing was very fortunate to get some support from the IOC to, to run these programs. Um, and we hope that, you know, this will really be a catalyst to help us build on the inclusion of women uh, in the sport and also the opportunities that we can give women already in the sport. So uh, on behalf of World Sailing, I'd like to welcome you to Australian Sailing's she Sales National Leadership Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, well, we hope you all enjoy tonight. And to kick things off, we're delighted to share our newly launched She Sales promotional video. No, 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 let's go. No hesitating. We gotta move, we gotta shake, we gotta get up on the elevator. Your mind says yes and your body says oh, oh let's go, oh, oh, oh. let's go, 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 let's go. Discover what your local club has to offer. Wow, that was fantastic. Thank you. I'm really inspired. I'm, I'm actually really loving this She Sales program and initiative around getting more women involved in all levels of, of sailing. So much so, I, I Googled my local club and I'm really thrilled. They've got a sip and sail keel boat experience. And I think that speaks to me. I think a bit of sip and sailing, um, I'm not sure what order they do it in, but I'm hoping that it's sailing first. Um, it sounds fantastic. I'm also really looking forward to going around the waterways to find out what some of the clubs are doing to bring this really important she sails message to life. And I heard someone say the other day about sailing, there's a boat to suit everyone or a role to include everyone. And I just think they are wonderful messages for any sport um, to endear people to come and try. So first of all, I'm going to NT. I'm going to set sail and go to the Northern Territory to join up with Fiona McManus and Kelly Wilson. So welcome to you both. This, you, is a great, this is a great story. It's a story about 20 women from the NT who are heading off to the 2020 Australian Women's Keelboat Regatta. And unfortunately, like many other people, their travel plans got ditched because of COVID-19. 
But instead of wallowing in their disappointment, they put their heads together, as women often do, and uh, decided that they'd come up with a plan to start MT's very own women's keelboat, the Gatta, which has now become a flagship event in the NT sailing calendar. And I'm intrigued how you got so many women, 80 sailors making up 13 crews in your very first regatta, and I'm sure other people. So I'm, I'm going to ask you both, please, tell us a secret. How did you get, go about getting the event off the ground, including the lead-up events that got so many participants to come to your first event? Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, uh, first of all, my name is Fiona McManus and um, this is Kelly. Um, I've been involved with organising um, and participating in the Australian Women's Kilbert Regatta since 2014. And um, so, and we had one team leading up to 2018. I think we had two teams then. And then 2019, we were, we, oh, well, 2020, we were going to have uh, four teams of 20 women going over and um, and of course we were just so devastated um, that we yeah we put our heads together um, it was just a spur of the moment sort of decision and um, killed so we were out at, we were out at a training event so for for our particular <laughs> team going um, and we we realized that we wouldn't be going to Melbourne and we were devastated. So heading off to the car after training, I, I turned to Fiona and I said, if we can get 20 women to go to Melbourne and all that involves, how many can we get here in Darwin? So we had a bit of a chat. We got a bit excited. We started talking. We talked to the rear Commodore Sailing here. Uh, we talked to Claire Hall, who is our club services officer up here. And um, we said, what about this? Um, and it just started the ball rolling. It was incredible. We got the word out. We had eight weeks from when it first came onto the calendar to uh, Regatta Day. Uh, it was crazy. We had involvement from the entire club, um, mm. from sponsors. Uh, it was brilliant. Um, yeah, we sent out a request um, interstate for expressions of interest and, or, and to the uh, Northern Territory clubs as well and received a number of requests from uh, interstate teams um, willing to put a team together and come up here. Um, unfortunately, though, because uh, Victoria and New South Wales were so very seriously locked down with COVID, uh, we didn't get teams from there. But we had uh, two teams from South Australia actually come up and a team from Mooloolaba with uh, Tanya Kelly, who's actually speaking later today, hopefully. Um, yes, yeah, so that was pretty exciting to have the interstate teams coming up here. And they raced in our Elliott Sevens, um, which are club boats and available um, for, for this regatta. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow, eight weeks. That doesn't seem a very long time to put a regatta of this size together. And I hear that there was a very, very strong social program attached to it as well. But I'm, I'm keen, and I'm sure others are keen too, to find out what do you think was the key to the success of your, of your regatta? Oh, we were just so excited to put it on. Um, the momentum was huge. Because we couldn't go anywhere and, you know, you know what sailing's like, it's very addictive. You need to keep doing it as much as possible. Um, once we put the word out that we weren't going to Melbourne, that we were going to run our own, we have people come in from um, all over the place. We have brand new people coming in that had never sailed before at all. Uh, we had return people come in who'd been sailing as kids uh, and they came back for this event. Uh, we had um, some of the success stories were uh, women who'd been sailing for years with their partners or husbands but had never taken the helm. So then we had uh, brand new skippers. We had uh, brand new skippers who'd never been taken the boat through a lock before because, of course, we have big tides here in Darwin. Um, so lots of success stories came out of the event. Fantastic. Um, and I'm sure like any event, you get to the end of it and you reflect back on how things have gone and how you might do some 
things differently next time around? What were your learnings that other clubs might um, take advantage of? Um, well, some of the success factors were engaging lots more local women into sailing um, and crewing, and it was also a great opportunity to form relationships with interstate sailing clubs and the girls who came up and represented those clubs. Um, it built confidence and trust in a lot of the boat owners in Darwin who lent us their, their yachts. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and it highlighted regattas are uh, lots of fun too. Um, I think I think yeah. some of the things we would do differently um, yeah. is we would give ourselves more time than eight weeks to pull a regatta together. That was pushing it a little bit. Um, we, we've actually we ran yeah. the second regatta this year, and we didn't actually have that much more time. Um, and in fact, we were locked down until Thursday afternoon prior to our last regatta. So that put a little bit of a halt in proceedings, but um, definitely getting ahead of schedule, um, getting the word out a lot more, I think, advertising, getting it up on Facebook, getting enthusiasm with our um, club as well. Because um, of course, we're going to do it all again next year. Mm. So that brings me to my final question. I mean, obviously, for such a great event like that, what's the plans? Uh, we're going to do it again. Okay, so we, we're actually, we have it in our calendar. We have next dates year. already, yes. yes. Uh, we will be running the uh, Northern Territory Women's Regatta. It's no longer just a keelboat regatta because we're very inclusive. So we've got multi-holes happening as well. Uh, they'll be running on uh, the 6th and 7th of August in 2022. Um, we have got the Alliance. We're looking for more skippers. We want lots of people to come up and see the absolute amazing pleasure of being in Darwin and Salem. It's a prime time of year to August in, the, in Darwin. Fantastic. And I'm assuming the borders will be open and we'll all be flurrying up to take part in that wonderful event. And thank you for announcing the dates here as an exclusive for the National Conference. So well done. Well done. Eight weeks. It blows my mind how you put something together that that's successful. Um, give yourself a bit more time for the next one. And uh, thanks for sharing your story. Um, we're going to head over to WA. I believe the borders are open or online borders are open anyway, and I'm um, really thrilled. We want to find out a little bit more about the WA Parasailing Festival of She Sails. And, and that was developed to coincide with International Women's Day. Um, it was an initiative of, of parasailing champion Robert Crofts, and welcome Robert tonight, and Australian parasailing coach Grant Alderson. We're also joined by Genevieve Wickham, who took the role of the She Sales Ambassador. And, and how fitting for that. Genevieve, welcome and congratulations. I believe you've just again been named Australian Sailing WA Parasailer of the Year for 2021. So that's absolutely wonderful. You must be very, very proud. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And, and the thing is too, um, I'm very humbled by all of the accolades around this room, to be brutally honest, but I understand you also won this award in 2010, 13, 18 and 19. So you're a very recognised parasailer and I believe a very popular face um, of the sailing fraternity. So welcome and congratulations. I'll, I'll turn to Robert for a moment because I'm really keen on the initiative what's involved and what have been the benefits to both participation and the club? Thank you, Sue. Well, firstly, welcome to everyone from the uh, brand new Royal Perth Yacht Club She Sales VIP Lounge in the city. Uh, we've set up a uh, home here for this afternoon. The Festival of She Sales was an idea that Genevieve Grant and I formed after a regular Wednesday afternoon uh, racing session at Royal Perth Yacht Club. It was uh, synchronised with International Women's Day on the 8th of March 2021. Uh, coincidentally, that was a Tuesday. We uh, developed a month-long celebration to uh, shine the spotlight on all of the women in the 
Royal Perth Yacht Club sailing community. The sailors, of course, the volunteers, the support workers and uh, um, uh, family and friends. And um, we essentially dedicated uh, every opportunity to showcase what these women and girls do behind the scenes to, to elevate the sport. Uh, approximately 50% of our sailors in the WA parasailing squad are women. 50% of our support workers are elite junior women. Um, it's quite astounding, really, uh, how uh, strong a representation we have in the, um, in the uh, club membership. On a typical Wednesday afternoon at Royal Perth Yacht Club in the summer season, there are 60 kilobytes out racing and approximately 10% of those boats are helmed by women. There are obviously women in various crewing capacities racing in the afternoon, but our role is, our objective, I should say, is to increase the participation of women in control of the, um, of the boat. And uh, that's a big part of the WA Parasailing Squad, developing the skill sets so that women can confidently race in the afternoon. The theme for International Women's Day this year was Choose to Challenge. And it's all about applauding equality for women in sport. And we felt that this message was essentially the same message as this, as this She Sales message. So with Genevieve and Grant, we developed a month long festival and it uh, revolved around racing every Wednesday afternoon, exclusively with women helming our, our 18 foot skiff uh, and, um, and come and try days exclusively for women. Um, boat christenings with uh, women only VIP lounges on the jetty and so on. And um, it really was a fun event. And I guess that's a significant part of any festival. It needs to be fun and the people are then attracted to it. Great. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. And what a great, great event. Um, and just really embodying that whole notion that there is a boat for everyone and that there is a role for everyone. And great to hear of women taking the helm as well. Now, you're obviously both real advocates and ambassadors for access and diversity and inclusion um, for everyone. And so that's wonderful. Um, you're also both members of the Royal Perth Yacht Club. And I'm interested in, you know, what does that, and this probably speaks to um, Sarah Stiles' um, speech later, but what has been part of that club done for you both in terms of your, your participation, not only sailors, but as, as volunteers? I can speak on behalf of Genevieve and myself and all of our squad members, actually, in this regard. Royal Perth Yacht Club, is, is an inclusive club. They don't just have that as a bullet point in their mission statement, or uh, if you like, in a token, token way, uh, embedded in simple aspects of the club life, it's built into the daily operations and the, uh, the sense of belonging in, in the club. Um, in all of the obvious areas, accessible uh, parking and facilities and infrastructure, floating jetties and, um, and so on, but really amongst the membership. It's quite a common thing on a Wednesday afternoon to have a half a dozen wheelchairs or uh, similar uh, um, visitations in the wardroom for presentation and results. Uh, we share our 18 foot skiff with other parasailers in the squad and um, it's just become completely normalized for, for women to be receiving awards and for, for women in particular with disabilities to, uh, to be recognised first and foremost as sailors. And that's our mission. We don't want special treatment. We just identify as sailors and, um, and, uh, and we're enjoying quite a lot of success in that regard. The club embrace everything we do. Uh, it's only really Matt Werning winning a gold medal at the Paralympics or John Sadder sailing around the world for the 11th time that bumps us off the front page of the club magazine. We, um, we uh, enjoy a lot of support in the club and 
uh, we're very grateful and we're both very proud to be members of the club. I think the, the essence of Royal Perth Yacht Club's inclusion strategy is that Royal Perth Yacht Club embraced the Australian sailing, parasailing pathways. Most clubs, hopefully, have an opportunity for people with a disability to come and sail at the novice level. But Royal Perth Yacht Club have taken this one step further and they've embraced in a, in a, in a complete way the Australian parasailing pathways, which provide competition and uh, development and performance opportunities at the elite level for sailors who want to take it further. And that's what we're excited about. Uh, a key takeaway for everyone watching today is to uh, access the Australian sailing parasailing pathways and to, to audit your own yacht club processes and, uh, if you like, uh, inclusivity and, and see if these key points can be embedded into your club. Thank you, Robert. I really appreciate that. And I, I love the fact that you have separated access and inclusion because, you know, they are, they, they, they intermarry, but they're very different things. And it sounds like your club's doing a wonderful job. If you could give a club, another club, one tip around how to become more accessible, um, what would it be? I think the key thing is with the people. Parasailers just want to be recognised and acknowledged as sailors. We just want to race in the main fleets, whether they be dinghy division fleets or keelboat fleets. And, um, and we just want to, uh, if you like, be part of the main game. We want our regattas to be part of the, 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 the main fleets. And um, I guess the, the key challenge for clubs is to ensure that suitable boats are accessible. We have a, we were very fortunate. Daniel Fitzgibbon and Liesl Tesh were perhaps uh, uh, undecided in a given week and they decided to sell their 18 foot skiff, the gold medal winning skiff from the Rio Par Paralympics to the WA Parasailing Squad. So we're very fortunate to have a boat that has a special seat uh, and we're obviously very lucky to sail with Grant Alderson, the Australian mm -hmm. parasailing coach every Wednesday. Now today, Genevieve and I have made the ultimate sacrifice to attend the She Sails Leadership Conference. We decided not to sail today. <laughs> oh. and, uh, and so as we speak, Grant Alderson is uh, racing with Natalie Alexander. She's one of our newest recruits. She has just returned from the Tokyo Paralympics where she was a key member of the Australian gliders uh, wheelchair basketball team. And, um, and she's deputising for us today, which would be a great thrill. And yeah. this particular boat is very fast, by the way, and uh, ordinarily we win the fastest pennant. So that'll be a great uh, thrill uh, to hear the news when we return back to the club later on uh, this afternoon. Well, I'm so pleased that you chose us over the sailing, as much as it seems to have pained you, Genevieve. And I think you have really shown and spoken to that message that there is a boat for everyone. And, you know, the importance of community connection and people being engaged, all people being engaged through sport. And I think that probably is a, a lovely segue um, into our next speaker um, in Sarah Styles. So I, just before we did move on, thanks to Kelly and Fiona and Genevieve and Robert for sharing your stories and um, they will be available for viewing on the website. I'm now going to introduce one of the evening's special guests and we would encourage you to use the Q&A. So if you've got questions of Sarah, um, please, the Q&A appears in the lower part of your screen. Olivia Newman will be sitting in the background moderating them madly. We'll get to as many as we possibly can. We may, we may join a few up together for expediency. So Sarah Stiles. Sarah Stiles in May stood in some very big shoes and they were the shoes of Bridie O'Donnell who was the former director of the Office of Women in Sport and Recreation and I'm delighted Sarah that you've taken on that role. I couldn't have been more pleased to learn of your appointment. Now I met Sarah when she was working with Cricket Australia where she was head of female engagement and her leadership culminated in the historic ICC Women's T20 World Cup 
final at the MCG, which was hugely attended, and um, last year on International Women's Day. So let's just say that Sarah Styles, the Sarah Styles that I know, doesn't do anything in halves. So Sarah's going to speak to us tonight around gender and gender diversity and, and the value of sport. And we do encourage you, we'll have plenty of time for some, some Q&A. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Sarah, to take over and uh, really looking forward to what you have to say um, for us. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Sue. And that's what, thank you so much for the opportunity to actually speak tonight. I feel like we need to get comfortable, don't we? Sometimes these things, we're, we're sort of, you know, how are we? We're about half an hour in, get a chance to take a breath, settle in, and we'll, we'll get going. But yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. And I mean, congratulations as well to everyone who's actually participating in tonight's event. No matter where you are, you being here is driving change. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all joining from and pay my respects to their elders past and present. We need as many women in leadership roles as possible throughout the sport and recreation industry. And as I said, simply by participating in the conference tonight, you're all playing an important role for change. So I want wherever you are around the country, I want you to be patting yourself on the back because it is important to be celebrating progress. It's important to be celebrating and recognising each of your efforts. As Sue said, I'm fortunate to be the Director of the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation, a role I did step into in May and as Sue said, some very, very large fill, uh, shoes to fill, but I'm just so excited because the office is the first of its kind in Australia and it exists because the Victorian Government, and not they're not the only one, but the Victorian Government is committed to increasing the number of women and girls participating in sport and active recreation and that ranges from grassroots and community sport participation right through to senior leadership roles and boardrooms of our sports leadership. For me, my journey started growing up in country Victoria. I'm from a little town called Cobden and my main sport was pretty much the same answer a lot of women of my generation would actually give and I did smile when I saw there were so many Sarahs on tonight's um, session because uh, women of a certain age, there are quite a few of us, um, but my main sport was netball and quite simply I played netball because that was the only girls sport that was actually available in my small town. You had the choice of netball and netball and so three to four days a week, guess what I was doing? Netball. That was the norm. Now, don't get me wrong, clearly if I'm doing it three or four days a week, I did love playing. And reality is I loved everything about sport. Any chance I had to put my hand up for something, it didn't matter what it was, I was first in line. And if I'm really honest, <laughs> and so you'll get a kick out of this, it will surprise no one, I was often the self-appointed captain of these teams. I just sort of just made that role for myself often. Um, and it wasn't until really that I reached adulthood, that I started to reflect on those times and start to see how these gendered lines were actually having a strong influence on all of our lives. And that's from, you know, the sports we played, to what we study, to what career paths we might be aiming for, to what expectations there are around even family roles and everything in between. I began to understand what we uh, see in Australia in terms of the gendered nature of these parts of our society. And I began to see that the, the strength of those, um, what do we wanna call it? The strength of those skews is actually quite strong when we compare ourselves to similar cultures around the world. You know, you grow up and you sort of see the world in a particular way. And then maybe you've got to be a little bit older as at least in my case I did to look back and kind of go, oh, hang on, I'm not sure that really made sense. Because ultimately, what do I want? I want every single one of us, no matter who we are or where we're from, to experience that freedom, the energy and the joy that sport, that sport can bring. And that was a real hallmark of my childhood. You know, and I want every single one of us to have equal opportunity in all aspects of life, sport included. And it just happens to be that I'm fortunate enough to have this platform to particularly drive change and champion for change in sport. As we know, stating the obvious, women and girls make up just over half of the Australian population. And the evidence shows what we already know, that there is no inherent differences in the distribution of intelligence, in capability across the population. 
And yet, what are we seeing? We're still seeing women be underrepresented in parts of our lives and including being underrepresented in leadership roles in sport. There is no reason why this um, difference should happen. And what's really important is people often sort of say, oh, that's because there are no women in sport. That's just not true. We all know that's not true. And if you look at actually the, the workforce of sport and um, so the sport and recreation sector, that workforce is actually remarkably gender balanced. So somehow between the start and the top, something is going wrong. And this is particularly the case when we look at the leadership of national sporting organisations. So obviously preaching to the choir tonight, but I want us to have a think about why does it matter to have that gender diversity on our boards, on our committees, and in other management roles um, within sport. Programs like She Sales are a good illustration of why it matters. This program is helping sailing meet the needs and the preferences of women and girls. And they're doing that by ensuring the voice, the opinions and the specific nuances and requirements of women and girls in sport, and particularly in sailing, are being heard and are being actively catered for. This includes by ensuring a safe and welcoming environment for women and girls. Let's just start with the basics there. It's by ensuring as well, women leaders and women and girls participating are visible to inspire more women and girls to sailing. The journeys and experiences that women have in sport can be very different at all levels, in community sport, in elite sport, and in sport leadership. A comment that I sometimes see on my own social media feed is why isn't there an office for men in sport and recreation? If you think I'm making it up, feel free to jump on my LinkedIn and have a look at some of those comments because, yeah, it, uh, whenever I see it, I do pause, I take a deep breath, we shake it off, and then what do we do? We go back to the facts. Reality is there are structural barriers like the lack of female-friendly facilities. And I'm thinking in this space, inadequate change rooms. Um, I'm not sure about you, but I would prefer to be get, uh, getting dressed <laughs> um, with a closed door and not in an open urinal. Lights in car parks, things like that, that impact our sense of safety. That is happening more for women and girls than it is for men and boys. There are practical barriers, like girls being made to wear uniforms designed for, for um, boys' bodies, even if they're called unisex, reality is they're not, or uniforms that they don't feel comfortable in. Something as simple as a young woman being asked to wear white pants can actually be enough for her to decide, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. And this is especially important when you're thinking about girls who are on the fence of being able to continue with sport. Reality is those of us who love it, who, are, who you know, it's a fundamental part of our lives, we might see it as an annoyance, but that's not going to stop us. It's for the women and girls in the middle that that's enough to say, you know what, mm, no thanks, not for me. It's things like as well, women and girls teams or, or, or female athletes not being given access to the facilities, the equipment, the courses, the times, um, in a way that is as equal to their male counterparts. There's also the fear of judgment, the fear of failure. Stepping into a sporting club, as I'm sure many of us know, can be incredibly intimidating. I remember myself when I was 14 and I was just getting to the age where I wanted to play netball at my local football netball club. At that point or up until that point, I'd only been playing in things linked to my schools. And I'm like, no, I really, that's something I want to do. And the, um, I still remember that sense of, what, what was it? It was just outright fear, isn't it? To walk yourself down there, walk out to the court and say, can I please play? And I went to training that one time and then was that scared I didn't go back for a year, if I'm honest. And that's the thing, that's even with the love that I had of sport and what I do today. There's also what I view as one of the biggest barriers, and that's simply misconceptions. For example, people who just don't think women want to do something, or people who think girls aren't strong enough or tough enough. And I wonder how those misconceptions might be playing out um, in sailing sometimes. Sometimes as well, those misconceptions can be internalized. And this is where that saying of you can't be what you can't see comes to mind. Because sometimes if those young girls can't see themselves in a sport, it actually genuinely doesn't occur that, oh, hang on, maybe that's for me. 
maybe I'd love to do that. These factors are unfortunately why my office exists and what my job is, just like my job at Cricket Australia was as well. My job now is to get us to a place where I don't have a job and that the office is no longer needed. So as leaders in your club environment, so let's change tack here a little bit. As leaders in your club environment, you have a, a vital role to play in breaking down these barriers. For starters, just by doing what you're already doing, you are showcasing and inspiring others to get involved in your sport and showing that sailing truly is a sport for women and girls. By being an active member of your club, you are providing a voice for women and girls and that perspective that is so important and needed. Don't be afraid to speak up if something doesn't seem fair, if something doesn't seem equal, or just simply if something is going a certain way because that's the way it's always been, call it out. If you can see a different or a better way to do something, it will not only help you, but it will help others like you because your voice matters. At the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation, we actually run a suite of different programs and initiatives under the banner of Change Our Game. Breaking down the barriers to participation for women and girls and the barriers to leadership is a crucial step in changing a game. And sometimes I'm sort of thinking, I know this is preaching to the choir, but sometimes it's so important to be told, you know what, what you do matters and what you are doing matters. If we take a step back, why do we think it is important for women and girls to have equal opportunities in sport and recreation? It matters because of the place and the value of sport in our lives and in our Australian society. Sport and recreation offers massive opportunities for enriching our communities and our lives. And these opportunities should be available to all Australians equally and importantly, equitably, because we don't all start from the same spot. And one of my sayings when I think about things like this is we don't do this just because it's the right thing to do. We do this because it's the smart thing to do. Not only will we um, be able to defend ourselves in a modern Australia about what we are doing in a certain sport, our sport will also be better off by pursuing gender equality in sport. As I said, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, the, these things sometimes it's just important to recognise and remind ourselves. So when we talk about the value of sport, you know, what is it that comes to mind for you? Here are some of the things that come to mind for me. To start with, let's start with the most obvious, the health benefits that come from the value of sport. The prevention and management of disease, the fitness, the strength, if it's needed or if it's wanted, weight loss, the prevention of obesity, the reduced risks of mortality, improved mental well-being, and that is so critically important for the world that we're working in right now, reduced stress, reduced anxiety and depression, increased social connections and enjoyment. The value of sport includes, sorry, the value of diversity in sport includes improved board and organisational performance. When we have diversity in our decision-making rooms, that contributes to good governance, to leadership and better decision makings, as well as improved performance and risk management. The value of sport includes building stronger and more resilient communities. Sport contributes to building that social connectedness. There's a reason that so many communities like the community I grew up in are built around these sports clubs. It brings people together it helps to extend social networks. I remember um, my grandfather telling me the story of when he and his family first came over to Australia and they actually didn't speak English at that point in time. And how was it that they connected with their local community? It was through sport. Sport plays a role as well in teaching younger people those social values around respect, around responsibility, around commitment, around teamwork and leadership skills. These things are so important and there's evidence that shows, particularly for women and girls, that connection between sports participation because of those leadership skills it develops and ultimately leadership success in their later career. There's also about the fair use of public resources. 
Governments in Australia make substantial financial contribution to sport and active recreation, both at high performance and at community level through infrastructure and program investments. Given the health and economic and social benefits of sport, this investment of public money should be shared widely, including equally with women and girls. We should also think about the financial and economic benefits of sport. You know, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that when we think about the whole thing, sport and active recreation is actually a big business. And sometimes people don't like to talk about this. And while some of that money actually does go to those fortunate enough to make a living from sport, and I'm particularly thinking around um, elite male athletes and some industry leaders, and that's obviously a good living that I'm referring to there, the money generated by sport through broadcasting, through sponsorship, through ticket sales, that increases as a sport grows. So the more that women and girls opt in, the value of that sport grows. The overall sport grows and it builds and builds. There's also something that's really important to me when I think about sport. And I, I know I mentioned before about, you know, you can't be what you can't see. But the flip side of that is you can be what you can see. And one of the things that drives me most when I think about the value of sport and the role of sport in our country is the fact that sport is one of our most visible sectors. And when that highly visible sector represents the future that we all want, which is one of gender balance in not only the opportunities, but also in our leadership, that sets the bar for the world that the next generations are growing up in. It also sets the bar or raises the bar it's probably a better description, around other aspects of our lives, around what we no longer expect or accept as normal. So I'm thinking about our leadership in politics. I'm thinking about our leadership in corporate Australia. You know, sport sets the tone and is raising that bar for what our country looks like. Now, I obviously think it's critical for sports to be considering gender diversity. But none of us are also simply one thing. There are many facets of diversity. So for everybody listening tonight, I also want you to think about what does your community look like and how can you reflect that community in your sports club's membership and as well as in your leadership positions. So not only gender diversity, because if we only look at it like that, we are still limiting ourselves. And while it's human nature that we often surround ourselves with people who look and sound like us, who come from a similar background to us, who think like us because they have that similar lived experience. Doing this increases the risk of groupthink. And reality is much like we want gender diversity in a room to avoid that groupthink. Decisions should be made by leadership that includes different perspectives, different lived experience, different opinions and different energy. And that comes from that well-rounded sense of diversity and that lens of diversity. We mentioned earlier about how it is important to stop and smell the roses, to take a minute to enjoy progress that is happening to change our game, both big and small. Sometimes it is really easy to focus still on the journey ahead or perhaps to focus on the pains of the past. But in that moment, it is important to say, you know what, change is happening, even if we've got a way to go. You know, if I look around the corner, if I look around the country recently, you know, some of the things that stand out for me is the fact that, you know, only last week we actually saw that the A-League and W-League are actually going to be renamed to the A-Leagues because language matters. And this idea of sport in the past talking about, you know, men's sport as the main game, women's sport is something else with a W on it. We're finally moving past that. Two weeks ago, I was watching the AFL Grand Final and we saw two trailblazing women in Daisy Pearce and Abby Holmes in that commentary team for the very first time. You know, not that long ago, that just wasn't a realm that we were seeing women in. I'm not saying that was right, I'm saying that was wrong. But now not only do we see women there, we're seeing women universally recognised as some of the best in the business. Last month, Sue mentioned that I obviously was at Cricket Australia before this role. And the laws of cricket actually were uh, changed last month to reflect gender equal language and be more inclusive when something as simple as the word batsman was able to be evolved to batter. A change that started right here in Australia, if I um, can give myself a little bit of a pat on the back there. 
And a month prior to that, we saw the most gender equal games to date in Tokyo. And I was excited to hear what Sarah Kenny mentioned earlier about the milestone that will be achieved for sailing come 2024. Yes, we've got a long way to go until we have gender equality in sport and we shouldn't pretend otherwise. But it is so important to celebrate those small wins and I really do encourage you all to do that. While there has been significant progress in recent years, what drives me even more is to imagine where we will be in another 10 years time. With sailing being an Olympic sport, I'm sure you share my excitement when I dare to dream what the opportunity of the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics right here in Australia can deliver. These global events can be our lighthouse on the hill to accelerate change for women and girls in sport. For cricket, that was last year's World Cup. And we started looking at that five years out to say, well, what can that achieve? I want all sports and I want sailing to be thinking about what can a gender equal Australian sports sector look like come 2032? I'm imagining women and girls actively participating in numbers that we've never seen before. Girls and young women of all backgrounds comfortable and confident knowing that sport is fundamentally a place that they belong and sailing is a place that they belong. I'm imagining a nation who is proud of their thriving professional women's athletes and their competitions and their teams. I'm excited about women across the country not just earning a living wage from sport, but a wage that is supporting their financial security and future prosperity that is setting themselves up for their life after sport. I'm looking forward to gender balanced media and broadcast coverage. And I'm looking forward to the backing of corporate Australia to make that happen. You know, that's something that could easily, easily be world leading. And that's honestly because the bar for it at the moment is low. And that's also why it's important to celebrate the companies and the brands that are backing women in sport. And I'd just like to acknowledge Hamilton Island for its support tonight. And the other thing that I'm really excited about when I think forward is for a paid and a volunteer workforce where anyone holding any role is normal. And I heard that word, I think, from Robert earlier, just this idea of something being normalised from leadership that is just truly representative of the sector it, it, it is actually leading to coaching, to officiating, to governance, to administration, that that is just simply the norm. So by my account, that means we've got 11 years to um, eliminate the remaining inequities to full, to full participation in sport and in sailing, both on and off the field. So... I ask you, you know, what does that world look like for sailing in 11 years time? Because it might seem like a long way away, but reality is there's no time for us to waste. And by all of us, I genuinely mean all of us, including every single one of us on the session tonight, because everybody has a role to play in creating that world we all want. The She, Sa the she Sails, I knew I was gonna do that at some point, the She Sails program, aligns perfectly with the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation. And I invite you to join us in the Change Our Game movement and help us create the momentum for change. Sign up for our newsletter, jump on our social media, and also challenge us to do better. I also want to know about how I can support you to be a game changer. What do you need to be able to inspire others? Although we should keep in mind that obviously this is not just on women's shoulders. We need men to be stepping up beside women to make this happen. Now, before I finish tonight, I did want to, sorry, Sue, I know you're going to be wanting to jump in, but I did want to make a point of raising some of the opportunities that are also available for women joining from Victoria. So the Change Our Game website is where we share opportunities through our office that are available, including the scholarship grants that recently reopened that supports the professional development for women working as well as volunteering in sailing and all sports, I should obviously say. I can't wait to be sitting there in a few weeks time doing that assessment and just seeing, you know, being overwhelmed by the number of applications that I actually see linked back to sailing. That would be a wonderful thing to see. 
There's also a second program that's going to be opening next week to support women who are currently in or aspiring to governance roles. So that's the end of me plugging the things on my side, though. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you again for having me. And I can't wait to see what choices and actions you make to help build momentum for women in sailing. So, Sue, I might pass back to you and we'll see if we've still got a little bit of time to uh, do some questions. We have indeed, Sarah, and thank you very much. That certainly resonated for me. Although I look like a sailor, I'm actually in AFL. <laughs> And uh, my club has just been awarded a $4.6 million new facility because of the growth of female football. So, you know, if that's not a reason to get, uh, to get more females involved in your sport, I don't know what is. I do have a couple of questions. One's around the career of sport. You know, what advice can you give to women who are emerging or coming into sport as a career? So you know that's my favourite topic. Uh, <laughs> the funny thing is the main thing, oh, there's probably two, and I touched on it one of the pieces a little bit before, that there is this perception that there aren't women working in sport, and that perception is just wrong. There are so many women doing amazing things, and, yes, we need to work on the visibility of it because this is one of our problems. When people see sport being dominated by um male leaders, they assume that is the sector and it's not. So there are women there, know that there are women there. And probably the second thing I would say is just to flag the sheer variety of career options that actually do exist in sport. Honestly, I would love somebody to come to me to say, you know what, I'm this and I don't think I can work in sport because I could almost certainly build any single bridge, you know, whether that is around sport development, community participation, whether that is around, you know, marketing, events, digital, physios, medical, even engineering, anything you can imagine, there is a career path for you in sport. So just keep, you know, be really open-minded to the variety that is actually there. And also look at this, um, the, the various things that are actually there to help people get a start. Look at things like um, sports people, a great example where roles are, are, are promoted. Something like for younger women, sports grad, there's a bit of a theme in these names, isn't there? But sports grad, that is helping people get their start and really promoting the benefit of volunteering to kind of open those doors. So, yeah, know that women are there. Not, uh, seek them out if you can't see them and just know that there is a huge variety of career paths on offer. Yeah, I think that's a really good, um, and the building industry have done a really good job with it in terms of showcasing the, the jobs that are available and, and perhaps sport needs to do a little bit more of that. And I did see some new initiatives coming out um, over my LinkedIn around just that, around starting to showcase to Year 10 girls what sport opportunities are available to them. Um, here's, here's an interesting one. Have you managed the difference between coming across as being confident and perhaps coming across as being a bit cocky, particularly when you're feeling a bit um, underconfident in a, in a predominantly male setting. Yeah. I wish I could say that's an easy one. Um, and, and I can remember when, you know, I, I spoke about that journey I was on earlier in, um, in my life when I was looking back and realising, hang on, there was something going on here that that wasn't normal. It was around about that time as well. I can remember seeing something that really brought to light this idea of boss versus bossy. Um, and why was it that the stereotype led to, um, you know, um, men and boys being characterised in one way and women being characterised in another? So, you know, what is the main thing that I say? The most important thing is just be yourself. You know, don't change who you are. So, you know, that, that sense of putting yourself forward, backing yourself, ultimately that is where you're going to feel the most comfortable. That is where you're going to feel your best. And if that means you find yourself in an environment where you aren't being valued, try to find somewhere that will because finding that place where you can just be yourself as opposed to feeling like you have to change to fit in another environment. And the drain that ultimately will come from that is, is what, what I'd really recommend. I mean, reality is 
there is some research that does show that confidence versus cocky, like it's it's frustratingly real. And this is where my, I suppose, my fire comes from around the importance of the, tri- the, the change that we're trying to drive. Because ultimately, I do firmly believe what we are doing to raise the profile of women in sport and women's sport is resetting these these stereotypes that are just unhelpful and outdated. So, you know, we, we've moved past this world where, you know, a young girl is being told she's too talkative and yet the boy is being told, well, he's clearly a leader. Like these things are just holding us back. So how do we move past it? But in the meantime, if you find yourself in a situation like that, take a hard look at, you know what, do they deserve me is where I would say, Sue. Yep. Yeah, go in places where you're celebrated, not just tolerated. Um, I love it. I love it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, Sue. Yeah, and look, I think um, um, we do have another question around strategies. We we are running out of time, and I think you've already capped on a number of strategies around um, convincing people, convincing people around benefits of diversity for different styles of leadership, for government resourcing, um, increase of membership. You know, when's the last time my football club had 130 new members and families come into the club a long time ago. So I think, and the AIS have also put out a really good business case around the benefits of having women involved at various levels of sport. So I'm sorry if we didn't capture that that one. Um, But one thing I did want to say to encourage women to take leadership roles is that the expectations of leaders has changed a lot in given times. We've moved from leadership that was kind of like you had to be a hero to leaders that now provide hosts, are hosts to great environments, great safe environments for people to excel. So, you know, I think women do that stuff really well. So thank you very much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone got as much out of that as I did. I've been taking notes furiously. Um, I do want to just go back a little bit because we're going to we're going to set sail from the Lullabar um, back to Queensland, back around the grounds, and I'd really like to welcome Tanya Kelly. And if Tanya's got her um, video on, um, that would be great. Hello, Tanya, and um, I would love to say, you know, wow. Tanya is a Commodore, a female Commodore of the Lullabar Yacht Club and doing amazing things around, you know, leadership and increasing female participation across the board, in the clubhouse, on the water, around the board table. Um, When I read the bio, um, Tanya, I was actually curious to think about, you know, how many female Commodores are there? And so I went Googling and I didn't find the answer But what I did find was a whole lot of Google headlines. Club appoints first female Commodore in its 100-year history. So I kind of sense that there is some tradition attached to this that you are helping to helping to break. So welcome welcome to the table. Um, And I've got some clear questions around. Tell us what is your club actually doing to attract more women to the water, to the clubhouse, and around the board table. Thanks very much. Can you hear me there, Sue? Yes, I can. Excellent. Uh, Yeah, I have just apologies for uh, the timing delay uh, being in Queensland. uh, We seem to have missed something there. So my apologies for uh, not quite syncing in with you guys. Um, but yes, so we're in, up in um, Mooloolabar in uh, the Sunshine Coast, and we do have a really strong women's sailing program. Um, and so, you know, being a, a female Commodore, in fact, I, I'm actually not the first female Commodore at Mooloolabar Yacht Club. We have a little bit of history in that space. Um, Tracy Johnson was our first um, Commodore, uh, female Commodore, and, and there are quite a number, and uh, like certainly now um, there, there's sort of a, sh- a change and a shift. And you can see that um, that sort of rolling out in sort of like a sailing administration, more and more women having a presence there. In terms of the um, the sailing programs, we were very uh, one of the things that I guess it's so important is to have a champion. 
um, you know, in your clubs that, that really progress that. And you can see the clubs that have got that and have, have, been, have managed to get a lot moving um, on the back of a couple one or a couple of people that have really been into it. And we had that. So we were lucky enough to have Daniel Kennedy, who was a Canadian Olympian who happens to move to the Sunshine Coast um, and supported by a number of other female members, really sort of looked at this problem and said, well, what why is there a difference? And there was uh, in participation between men and women. And one of the things um, that was, you know, really clear for them was a capability gap. So something where, um, you know, I, I've been sailing since I was little and, uh, and the women sort of disappeared in the middle. You know, they were there in the dinghies and then something happened and they were gone. Um, and what was it that, that um, has women sort of leave sailing um, or, or perhaps not? Um, follow it in the way that the men do, in which that they then come, go along to perhaps own boats and run boats and do the tactics and do the do the skippering and do those, you know, really core thinking roles in in the in the sphere of particularly competitive sailing. And so, what we could see on the Sunshine Coast is that there were quite a lot of women participating, but not in the um, in the roles where decisions were made necessarily, particularly on the bigger boats. And, uh, and you know, having a look into that, you could see that um, once sort of women um, became regular crew, uh, they tend to get pigeon, tended to get pigeonholed in, in particular roles um, and not necessarily the, uh, you know, the classic 1950s style of getting the drinks, but, but certainly not in the, um, in the decision-making roles necessarily. So not, not to say that not all women weren't doing that, but that's what we saw. So uh, particularly uh, Danielle and that small group of um, really interested women started to put together a women's development program that was very open, that was um, run and led by women, and that really had at its core a desire to have women move up that decision-making tree when it came to sailing. Uh, and, and that's really what um, what has happened. So de- developing a pipeline, you know, starting off in that really early development phase and moving into a competitive ra- racing circuit. And what we've seen is that the format of, um, of women's racing um, across the country is awesome. There is a circuit and it, and it, and it works in a way where um, you start to know people who are on the circuit, um, you know what is going on in, the, in those different um, sailing clubs and what programs that they're running. And you don't always need to bring your own boat and you can travel, like, you know, COVID uh, might have put it into that for a little while, but there's, uh, there's a sense of uh, fellowship that comes with, with this women's sailing that's happening, particularly on the east coast um, of Australia, where, you know, it, it's something that is really a model for sailing more broadly, not just women's sailing. Because often you find yourself on a boat, you might travel for a regatta, but really you're just competing in your local club level. Whereas the women's sailing circuit is very innovative in that you're going to different clubs. You're often, you, you're often a, there's a mix of one design and, and offshore racing or inshore racing. You might be borrowing a boat, you might be taking your own, or you might be using the one design fleets that are at that, at that um, club. So it's very versatile. And it's really given our... Uh, our sailing women's development program a place to go so once you do that development then what do you do and you either go into cruising you go into our local club racing or you really join our racing squad and you start to travel and you start to have these awesome experiences so it has been um really fantastic for the club and now our club which runs a mix of offshore um, bay racing and also some inshore one design with our Elliott 6 racing fleet. We now, we we run a a regular weekend um, racing program and you can see that there's men and women competing on an equal footing and that the boys and the girls are all sort of looking at each other, who's going to win this week and, and what's going to happen. Uh, it's certainly not dominated by, you know, the men steering and the women doing other roles and that kind of thing. It's, it's really becoming quite open. And even the conversations in a social setting are, are about who can, who can, you know, whose time on distance is better, is, who's lining up the windward lay, who's getting, you know, in at the starts well, you know, who's picking the lines onto the marks, all that kind of thing. It's, it's not about gender in the clubhouse, it's about sailing. And that's just one of the most wonderful things that have come through the Women's Development Program that's, you know, there's this sort of parity and, and equity that's sort of developing that's beyond the program itself but into the broader, broader club.
Yeah. Thank you. You've actually answered some of my questions in terms of oh. what, what, what have been some of the benefits for your club, um, some of the enablers, obviously having a champion and, and, and the champions, as Sarah mentioned, um, male champions are, are very handy too. I know my, mm. yep. my, biggest, my biggest champion is a, a male. Um, just, just we've only probably got a, a minute to go, Tanya, but um, I'd really like to know, you know, what's the next thing you're going to actually challenge? You've obviously challenged some leadership. You've challenged that skill gap. You've challenged getting more women out on the water and sailing. Is there something else that you see that's a bit amiss that's the next thing? Well, I think, you know, in our broader leadership team, we almost have gender parity on the board. We're not quite there uh, within the club. So that's definitely something that we would like to see, um, that there's decision-making um, happening, you know, in a diverse way, in the club more broadly, uh, we're really interested in, in youth um, and it, you know having a having a youth program that is not dominated uh, simply by one gender. You know that we're really sort of looking, particularly in one design keelboats. We're more of a keelboat club than a dinghy club, um, and so really building a pipeline for women to come through our um, sister club, if you like. We're, you know, we've got a lovely um, dinghy sailing club you know, in our region that we, we work really closely with to really have a pipeline for men and women to come through into our youth program and to do keelboats that way. Great. Thank you. Look, clearly there's a lot of great leadership happening in this club and, and I point my finger at you um, and the people around you who are doing that. And I think, you know, if you're looking to an exemplar club, you know, open some conversations with clubs that have already got there. We did have a question saying, you know, how do you advocate? Well, I think we've got lots of advocates in the room. Pick up the phone and see what other clubs have done and then showcase them to your own club because um, nothing's better than a little bit of competition between clubs, I find. Um, oh, so indeed, <laughs> indeed, yep. So see what they're doing. So thank you very much, Tanya, and uh, I really appreciate you coming on. I'm sorry about the time difference. but um, Oh, but no, my apologies. Glad you got here. Um, and last but not least, I'd, I'd, I'd lastly like to introduce everyone to Lisa Dunlannan. Um, obviously a two-time Olympian, so quite quite humbled there, both at Rio and Tokyo. She sails with her cousin Jason in an Acra 17. I think that's an Acra 17 behind you. And are you at the front of that, that picture? Awesome. It looks almost scary um but uh, you know obviously very accomplished sailor silver at rio and fifth at tokyo what a fantastic career welcome and thank you very much for your time tonight lisa and i'd, I'd just like to ask you what's it like being a female going through that elite level pathway because we've talked club land but now let's get to high performance well, for me, it's been quite a positive experience. Obviously, I've hung around for quite um, a number of years at the elite level, um, but it has also been a really interesting one for me because the NACRA 17 is the first compulsory mixed gender class at the Olympics, which I think did fantastic things for female sailing. But it's also been really interesting because Jason and I have experienced similar things in Olympic sailing, but the opportunities that we've had are very, very different. So although it's been great and I love what I do, it's just, it's been a little bit challenging to see some professional opportunities go to my male counterpart that I don't have. And I think listening to Sarah Kenny earlier and realizing that, you know, we've come so far that we've now achieved gender equity at the Olympics. But for me, my challenge is to try get gender equity in professional sailing. So it's been um, a lovely journey, but it's also um, been one where I've had to bang my head against the wall a few times and say, what do you mean you don't think I'm capable of sailing that boat I've done exactly what Jason's done exact in fact I actually go on the front of the boat and pull all the ropes so give me a go um, so I think we all have had similar challenges in our point in time um, but yeah it's definitely going in the right direction but in my opinion we're not there yet I suppose back to Sarah's um, comments around you know you can't be what you can't see you're a fantastic role model and, um, you know, it's just wonderful to see you. And I love the fact that you're at the front of the boat. Um, <laughs> it, it's wonderful. So just tell Jason to stay stay where he is. Um, <laughs> tell me, what sort of changes have you seen over time? Oh, massive changes. I think um, Sarah Styles touched on this um, and that was talking about like the, even the simple things like the change rooms and the clothing. 
I remember when I was going through juniors, all the girls, it wasn't equal, but we were all huddled in one shower in the female change rooms. And then I found out the guys had 12 showers next door. So we would sneak into there so we didn't all have to huddle in together. And now I go down to the club and, you know, it's equal showers, which is such a simple thing, but it just reflects um, having a comfortable environment where, you know, people can get changed after sailing. And and the same thing with clothing, with wetsuits, having to wear wetsuits that are, you know, too long in the body or have too much crutch region. And imagine trying to tell a male sailor just to wear a large female suit, you'll be fine. It's the same as saying just wear a small male suit. It's I don't understand the logic behind it. Um, so it's changed a lot. Um, it's a lot more comfortable to be a female sailor at the professional level. Um, I think we are getting to a stage where men are recognising the talent that female sailors bring. Um, they may see them as you know bringing something to the table rather than just being an emotional person that can't make decisions there there are lots of initiatives in place for men to learn that women are just sailors so obviously the Knicks sailing at the olympics you've got the volvo ocean race being or the ocean race now being incentivized to take a woman the america's cup they're talking about having a women's series sail gp are trying to upskill the women so there's a lot of initiatives going on but i want to see the women in the roles actually doing the job let's not mess around anymore let's just get our hands dirty and and go for it because that's the only way to do it well done we've got a real champion of change here (laughs) Lisa so um, we heard what Danielle was able to help out with um, at Mooloola Bar so challenges out there Lisa you come that champion of change it sounds like you're very determined to to let's not actually have gender as being seen as diversity it's actually just normal if we go back to Robert's case it's just normal um, so thank you very much any tips for up and coming young athletes or sailors uh don't be afraid of trying something new or trying something that someone tells you not to do um you know someone has definitely told me that i'd never be strong enough to sail at the front of an acra and and i've proved them wrong so you should do that too yes good on you just go get it when did you actually start sailing I started sailing when I was nine um, and I moved into Canmarans when I was 16 and then on the Olympic circuit since 2013. Fantastic. Well done. You've had a wonderful career. So what can clubs, I suppose you've told us a little bit about, you know, equal showers and not making me wear a suit that's not designed for my body, Um, but what are some of the other things that you've seen, some of the best practice things that you've seen that clubs have done and some of the the cringeworthy things that you've um, experienced in your journey across the world probably? Well, um, at the beginning of the seminar, um, Sarah Ogilvie talked about the women-only regattas and I was lucky enough to be a coach at some of those events, um, both down in Melbourne and in Sydney. And for me, that's just been game-changing. I think it creates an environment where female sailors want to ask questions, they feel comfortable um, in a group asking questions um, to the coaches, and it also gives them women the opportunity to go in these race committee roles which they might just stand back oh I'll just do the flags you lay the course they have to step up so I think having those events is really important because it creates just that great environment where women can upskill they can flourish and they they don't feel that pressure um, of not being right whereas I find when you go to a regatta and you're in a group with a mixed class, you know, you, the men tend to not be afraid to be wrong as, men, as much as women. Um, so I think that's been great. Um, in terms of cringeworthy, I haven't seen anything particular um, in terms of club level. But, but what I would say is I am talking about these female events, but when we do separate male and female, I think it's really important not to make the female second class. So if you have a gold medal coach or you have your top level coach coaching the men, then you should have an equal amount of coaching for the women. Just because they're women doesn't mean that they should have a lesser coach. And and I've seen that in, you know, over my years, I've seen that um, in, it's really disappointing. We lose a lot of female sailors in Olympic sailing. So I think having that equal level of coaching um is is really really important and that's youth all the way to olympic 
Fantastic. Thank you. We have got a Q&A open now for Lisa and I've got a couple of questions come in now for you. How can we help to inspire the next generation of women into the sport of sailing? I think for me what was the clincher and what keeps me in it is that it's fun. It's social, it's enjoyable. You can take it at um, the sip and sail to the extreme NACRA 17, whatever you want, there's always something for you. So, and I think the social aspect's super important. Um, for me, that's why I stayed in Manly Juniors rather than quit sailing, because I loved going to the club every morning on a Sunday and hanging out with my friends. And now I, I love being able to go overseas and see all my friends that I sail against. And and even in the NACRA, we have like a chicks on two hulls group that we catch up at every regatta because we love to be social. And that's what keeps me loving the sport. It's about the journey. So having those social regattas um, and just making it really fun for the girls, because I think that's what um, drives females a lot of the time. And also that period between, you know, 16 to 21, where you just want to be social, we lose a lot of girls out of sport, but if we can make that connection I think that that would be um really really good for retaining females yeah well certainly um the club close to me is a very social place to be even for non-sailors so um you know it's a it's a, a great sport it's a great community setting by the water what else could you want um now we did talk Tanya talked earlier about there being a bit of a skills gap and I've got a question here that talks about what are the tangible skills we need to be, you know, teaching girls um, or sailors, young sailors, to actually make sure that that, that skill gap isn't um, a visible one. Obviously, it's been quite visible in the past. What do you think are the most critical skills that we have to teach? I think giving it a go and not being afraid. Like, I think this probably happens in, across industry, but as women, we want to be... Um, very experienced before we step up into a role. So we want to have all the qualifications and then, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take the helm or I'll do the tactics. Whereas men are like, you know, they're 70% there. They're like, yeah, I'll give it a go. So I think that um, things like swap days. So if the females always crewing, having swap days so that they get, you know, one go on, on the helm and then they think, oh, this is actually really fun. Um, the basic, I think there's so much off water stuff that you can do the tactics like, that's the great thing about sailing is that you're not limited by your physical capacity. So getting, um, having webinars like this where you have you know, world-class coaches teach tactical um, courses about how, so they can go on a yacht and, and do tactics. They don't have to do the physical stuff. Um, and then, yeah, just giving, giving it a go in lots of different positions and sailing with lots of different people, I think is another really good skill um, because you learn so much by sailing with different people rather than pigeonhole yourself um, into, into one type of sailing. Mm. I love your uh, tangible idea of the swap you know, the swap sailing and, you know, and, I, and also that when you were saying try and sail with different people, I was thinking about like a golf club where you, you just sign up and you play with a different four every time you play, you know, maybe there's opportunities to, to think of like that. Um, so now I'm going to probably embarrass you a little bit. We've got we've got a little video of you from a couple of years ago, but it's, it, the messages are still quite, quite, and you don't look a day older, to be brutally honest. Oh, that's good. <laughs> So we might just show that just for a bit of fun in closing. Sounds good. Thanks. This has been a delight. Hi, I'm Lisa Darmanin. I'm part of the Australian sailing team and I sail the NACRA 17. I first started sailing when I was eight years old and it wasn't the best experience. I was pretty terrified, it was windy and I didn't really know what I was doing. But I pushed through that, I sailed with my older brother and, and finally I finished a race. And after I was able to do that, I really enjoyed getting out on the water and even more enjoyed coming back to the club and talking about it with all my friends. Even though I race at the top competitive level, I love sailing because you can do it as competitively or as leisurely as you like. It's great just to be out on the water with your friends, enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the wind, and coming back after and having a chat about the day. 
It's great to see so many initiatives around Australia supporting women. I know I've participated in some women only regattas, coaching, race management and sailors. But She Sails is really about bringing that all together and encouraging all clubs and associations to get involved, to get more women in the sport. Sailing is such an amazing sport and we just want as many people to enjoy it as possible. I think that's a very fitting end to a, a fabulous night in listening to all these wonderful sailing initiatives, making sailing one of the most inclusive sports um, I have seen, which is wonderful. And the she sails certainly is taking a long way in terms of improving and increasing participation for women. So well done. Um, in closing, I just wanted to remind you of the she sails website and the she sails resource page. Um, but also the, um, there's a She Learns section on the website as well, which is something that I would encourage you all to go and have a look at and, and the website's showing there up on your screen. Um, in closing, I would like to firstly thank all the presenters very much um, for giving up your time, um, particularly Robert and Genevieve, who's also given up their sailing for the, for the evening. So I hope your crews did you proud. Um, to the organisers, Australian Sailing and She Sails, to Corinda and Olivia, um, they can't go without saying that you've put in an enormous amount of work to bring all these wonderful people together in one room. To the technical crew, well, gee, you've made that easy. Um, so, you know, made it really easy for everyone and well done in, in the background. And to all of you who've tuned in tonight. I believe there's over 200 registrations and that is actually more than that because some of you are sitting in, in groups. I really hope that you've enjoyed the evening and you've taken something away. I wish you all very well for the rest of 2021. Um, I'd encourage you if you've got any inquiries about um, any sailing issues or she sails or how to uh, how to do things differently in your club that you refer to your state representative and they are now showing up on your screen. So quickly scribble their name and number and email address down if you don't already have them. And I just wanted to wish after the very tumultuous time we've had in sport um, with COVID openings, closings, opening again and closing again, except in some states where you just seem to be able to stay open all the time, you might guess I'm in Victoria. Um, but may 2022 be nothing but smooth sailing for everyone involved here and everyone listening tonight. And I'd like to just finish by saying Good night to everyone and uh, congratulations. What a wonderful initiative She Sells is. Thanks, everyone. Good night.